Welcome to First Baptist Church. We draw strength and encouragement from one another, and it's good for God's people to be together, even though right now we're together electronically. It's good to see each other, it's good to talk to each other, and we pray that this time will, of singing and prayer will be a real encouragement and a blessing to you, wherever you are, when you watch this. For anyone who might not know me, I'm Dr. Alan Ingalls. I am a professor at Northeastern Baptist College here in Bennington, and my wife and I are members of this church. I'm always thankful for the opportunity to share a time of worship and word with you as we have today. Let's begin with prayer. Father, we are so grateful that we can, through the technology that we have available today, be together in a sense. We know this isn't fully the best, but we know that we can make this work for right now. We pray for comfort and strength for those who are ill. We pray for comfort and strength for our churches. We pray for, pray for unity in our churches and in our communities. We pray that all that is said and done in this service will bring glory to God. Amen. Charlie will now get us started with our music meditation. This is a time for us to reflect, meditate, calm our hearts, and prepare them for worship. Today we have relit the candles of hope 
Advent 1, and Faith, Advent 2. And now, this week, joy, the pink candle of joy. We have joy because the soon expected baby will be born in Bethlehem. Joy in anticipation of his arrival. Isaiah 12, 3 says, Therefore with joy shall they draw water out of the wells of salvation. We have joy remembering his birth, the gift of salvation through Christ, and his return to the earth in glory. Amen. Our first hymn together this morning is hymn number 92 in our hymn books, Joy to the World. come now to the time of our service when we pause for a moment to confess those sins that we have committed this week. We want to clear the air with the Lord. We want to settle accounts with him, so to speak. Our call to confession this morning is taken from the book of Luke, from which I'll be preaching on later on in Luke chapter 2, but the call to confession is taken from Luke chapter 18, verse 13. But the tax collector standing far off, would not even lift his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Let's pause for a moment as we confess our wrongdoings to the Lord. Our assurance of forgiveness is taken from the very next verse. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For, <clears throat> excuse me, for everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. Our scripture reading this morning is taken, as I mentioned, from Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. In those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria, and all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David 
to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was with child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. And in the same region, there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy that shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste, and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. Our next hymn is hymn 99, While by the Sheep We Watched at Night. <clears throat> come to the part of our service where we would normally, if we were together in the room, take our offering. I want to remind you that as you watch, uh, consider the fact that the church ministries are going on. The church is still uh, has needs. The church is still working to meet the needs of people in our church and in our community. So if the Lord puts it upon your heart, uh, to give to the needs of the church. You can find the church address on the church website, Google the church name and town, and that will take you to our church website, and you can mail in an offering to help with the needs of the church. We'll pause now as Charlie uh, plays an organ meditation for the offertory.
are so grateful for the resources that you have given out to us to enable us to carry on your work, your ministry in this community. We thank you for the offerings that have come in in recent days, and we thank you for offerings that, that you're stirring hearts right now to give. We pray that they would be able to give generously to your work. We pray for those who are, are afflicted with the virus that is going around our country right now. And th these are difficult days for those who have the virus. This illness can be a minor nuisance or it can be a very serious, life-changing event. We, we pray for those who have the virus. We pray for those as well, Lord, who are affected by all the changes that have been made. Businesses that, that are being forced to close. Some businesses that are, that are having to close for good because they simply cannot keep their business alive. So many out of work. So many needs, Lord. We pray for our country. We pray for our country as, as the election that we had so recently is, is still not settled. And we pray that your will would be done in this matter. We know, Lord, you are sovereign, you are in control, and we pray that you would bring about a good outcome for this country. We also pray for those who lead our church here at First Baptist. We're without a regular shepherd right now, and these are difficult days to find a new pastor. We pray that you would help them as they seek to find a new pastor for this flock. We pray that you would bring in just the right pastor for this church. Someone who will lead us in the way of goodness and righteousness. For all these things, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name. And we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. When I was in high school, my favorite author was Alastair MacLean, the Scottish author. One of his most famous books was The Guns of Navarone. Perhaps you've heard of it, perhaps you've seen the movie that was done many years ago about that book. The book is set in World War II, and though the book is fictional, it was based on some real events that happened in that part of the world during World War II. So the story goes, 1,200 soldiers are trapped on the island of Karos. A German invasion is imminent, and those men on Karos will all be killed or captured because the Royal Navy is unable to reach them. There was only one good deep water channel for the big Navy ships to go through, and that was guarded by the enormous guns at a fortress called Navarone. 1,200 men waiting to die unless a small hand-picked commando unit can destroy the guns and allow the Royal Navy free passage to Karos. Waiting. Waiting to die. Let's change the scene. God told Adam and Eve not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For, he said, in the day you eat of it, you will surely die. They ate of it anyways. And the refrain of Genesis becomes, and he died. Nevertheless, God promised Adam and Eve that one day he would send a savior who would fix the sin problem once and for all. Prophets all through the Old Testament described this coming Messiah. But the world waited, painfully, fearfully. They were hoping this Messiah would come even as death stalked them. Waited. 
This is where we pick up in Luke chapter 2. God has prepared Zechariah and Elizabeth. He has prepared Mary and Joseph. And the time has come. Let's take a look at the text. We begin with the birth of the Savior in verses 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. Caesar Augustus was the Roman emperor who ruled from 31 BC to AD 40, uh, 14. Augustus allowed the Jews considerable freedom of religion, on, especially under Herod, who died in 4 BC. Caesarea was the Roman provincial capital, but a small Roman garrison was stationed in Jerusalem, the Jewish capital, just to keep them in line. The Jewish Sanhedrin ran day-to-day -day affairs in Judah, but was unable to inflict the death penalty without the approval of the Roman governor. Verse 2, this was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. We know that a census was taken in AD 6. Censuses were normally taken in Egypt every 14 years. We would assume that it was probably similar in Syria, Palestine at this time. If that's the case, there would have been a census probably in 8 BC. We know that Quirinius was governor of Syria, Palestine from AD 6 to 9, but that's way too late for our purposes. We do know that a man named Saturninus was the official governor of Syria, Palestine in 8 BC. But we also know that Quirinius was a powerful and influential military leader in Palestine at that time. Now, think about this. If Biden is sworn in as president on January 20th. Will we continue to refer to him as Vice President Biden? No, of course not. From then on, except when we're talking about a specific, something specifically that happened while he was Vice President, we're going to refer to him as President Biden. Luke, looking back at this time, would naturally use the title for Quirinius that was the highest title he attained, governor. But even in 8 BC, Quirinius was a very powerful and influential man, perhaps at some point acting governor. We're not sure. But this is the setting that Luke sets for us. And Luke was very, very careful with this history. Each person had to register at his ancestral city, ancestral city. And all went out to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the town of Nazareth, to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David. This is some thousand years after David. It's a long time. And yet people still knew their genealogy. They knew where they were from. They knew what family they were from. They knew where their tribal territory was. And Joseph, even though he was living in Nazareth in the far north in Galilee, near the Sea of Galilee, knew that he was from the line of David which meant that he needed to return to Bethlehem. I'm kind of glad they don't make us do that to pay our taxes today. Uh, my daughter traced the lineage of the Ingalls back to Skirbeck, Lincolnshire, England, 1525. That would be quite a trip if I had to go to Lincolnshire, England every year to pay my taxes, or even every few years. I'm glad we don't have to do that today. But Joseph needed to return to Bethlehem. This would be much the same journey that Mary had just made to go visit her cousin Elizabeth. A journey from Galilee down through the mountains to Bethlehem at this point 
would have probably taken four to five days of hard travel with a woman who is nine months pregnant. This would have been a difficult journey, to say the least. And yet Joseph, for whatever reason, felt it necessary for Mary to travel with him. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger because there was no place for them in the inn. She did what every mother in that day would have done. She wrapped him up snugly in some swaddling cloths to keep him comfortable. We still do that with, with babies. We wrap them up in the blanket nice and snug so that they feel comfortable. She did that, and then she did what no other mother in Bethlehem did in that day. She laid him in the feeding trough. That's what a manger was. It was a, a small box, wooden box, raised up a little bit off the ground. They would put food in for the cattle. Straw, hay. Wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger. Because there was no room for them at the inn. Now, I don't blame the innkeeper. Honestly, the, things must have been chaos with everyone coming home to, to pay their taxes. There just probably was no place to stay. And the fact of the matter is, a stable wasn't much worse than most typical rural homes. In many rural homes, they brought some of the, the sheep and the animals into the house with them at night. This would have been a very normal thing probably didn't bother Joseph and Mary too much. But it was just odd enough that it could serve as a sign for the shepherds who were about to be invited to this party. Verse 8, And in the same region there were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. Zechariah and Mary both responded with fear. Getting a visit from an angel was a scary thing. It was not something normal. You didn't just say, oh, hi, angel. And these shepherds also were afraid. And the angel said to them, Fear not, for I bring you good news of a great joy that shall be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. We need to break that down a little bit. First of all, they refer to this as good news. This is the same Greek word from which we get evangelize and evangelism. To spread good news. And the shepherds are the first ones to get this good news. Shepherds. It's kind of strange. David was a shepherd. David, king of Israel. Psalm 78 says, The Lord chose David his servant and took him from the sheepfolds to shepherd Jacob his people. David himself compared the Lord to a shepherd in Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd. Several other psalms, one by Asaph, a couple of others that we're not told who wrote them. Psalm uh, 95, Psalm 100, also refer to the Lord as a shepherd. Jesus compared himself in John 10 to a shepherd. Other kings in that day referred to themselves as shepherds. I, I can take you to a, an ancient document written by the old Assyrian king Esarhaddon, who refers to himself as a shepherd of the people. You would think that shepherds would be 
respectable. They weren't. In one of the early rabbinic writings called the Mishnah, Abba Gurion of Zidon says in the name of Abba Guria, a man should not teach his son to be an ass driver or a camel driver or a hairdresser or a sailor or a shepherd or a shopkeeper for their craft is the craft of robbers. What is he saying? He's saying all of those professions are dishonorable and dishonest. You can't trust them. Rabbi Judas says in his name, ass drivers are most of them wicked men, but camel drivers are straightforward. Sailors are mostly pious men, but the mess, best of doctors is for Gehenna. Gehenna was the city dump outside the gates of Jerusalem where the trash burned day and night. The stench was unbelievable. And as a result, the city dump became a synonym for the place of God's punishment, someplace we would call hell. Even the best of doctors is, about all you can do is send them to hell. Not much respect for doctors in those days. And the most worthy among butchers is a partner for Amalek. Amalek was one of Judah's historical enemies. They'd been enemies with Judah for 2,000 years, 1,500 years. Shepherds were not well respected. They weren't trusted. God sent his first announcement of the birth of his son to shepherds. Think about that for a moment. One of Luke's points in the gospel, if you, if you want to sit down and read through the whole gospel of Luke, which you can do in a sitting, think about this. Luke wants his readers to see that God was reaching out to everyone from the highest to the lowest. And that's why Luke, in the Gospel of Luke, highlights Jesus' ministry to, to Gentiles, to women, to the, to the low in society. Who are the lowly and the despised today? The farmers, the meat packers, the factory workers. The Gospel is them, for them, too. We've learned this year that truckers and grocery store clerks are indeed essential workers. We need everyone. Shepherds would sometimes have an enclosure where they would bring their sheep in at night. In that day and age, uh, shepherds lived with their flock during certain parts of the year. And they had a certain call. Each one had his own distinctive call. And his sheep knew that call and they would come to him. I read once of a case where uh, thieves attempted to make off with the flock of just such a shepherd. And as the thief was about to go over the hill and go out of sight, the shepherd let out his call and all the sheep turned around and come running back to him. Jesus in John 10 says, My sheep know my voice, and they listen to me. So at night, to protect the sheep, they would have an enclosure, and several shepherds would bring all their sheep into this central enclosure where they could keep an eye on them all night and protect them. That's probably what they're, where they're at right now. They're in the fields with the sheep, number of shepherds together with their flocks. And the angel appears to them and gives them this wonderful news. A Savior is born. Notice what it says. It says it's good news, which we mentioned. A news of great joy. We focus today on the third candle of Advent. 
candle of joy. Good news of great joy. And when, you, when you back up, you can see that this whole passage has been building to this moment. In chapter 1, verse 14, Zechariah was told by the angel that the birth of his son John would be a source of joy. We know, of course, in the context, not because just because Elizabeth had been barren, but because John would be the forerunner, the way preparer of the Messiah. In chapter 1, verse 44, John leapt for joy in his mother's womb at the arrival of Mary. John, unborn, yet unborn, knew of his Savior's arrival, and he leapt for joy. In chapter 1, verse 47, Mary gives a, a, a beautiful hymn that bears a lot of resemblance, a lot of similarities to the song of Hannah in the book of Samuel. And in it she says, My spirit rejoices joy. And then in chapter 1, beginning with verse 68, Zechariah himself, now freed from his silence, utters a beautiful psalm of praise to God. He doesn't use the word joy in it. But you can't read that psalm without feeling the joy that's there. Good news. Great joy. This baby is to be the Savior. They've been looking for someone to save them from their sins. The curse of death has been passed from generation to generation for hundreds, thousands of years, from Adam and Eve down to that day. This child would be the long-awaited Savior. The Savior, Christ. The Greek word from which we get Christ is Christos. Kind of makes sense, right? But Christos is a translation of the Old Testament from which we get the word Messiah. This child would be the long-awaited Messiah that they've been preparing for for so long. The Savior, the Christ, the Lord, Probably not an accident, although Lord could simply mean a boss, someone who's in a superior position. In the Old Testament, the proper name of the Lord was translated as Lord because the Jews did not want to pronounce the holy name, probably pronounced something like Yahweh. So when the angels announce the coming of the Lord, they would have made connections to the Old Testament and they would have said, this is somehow God. They wouldn't have understood that. Honestly, we, we look at it today. And the idea of the virgin birth still puzzles us. How can God become man? And yet, all of these ideas are wrapped up in the announcement of the angels. Good news, great joy, a Savior, the Christ, the Lord. The angel then tells them that they would find the baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Bethlehem was not a big town at this point. What are the chances of two, finding two babies lying in mangers? Probably zero. They go immediately to see this child. Look at verse 15. When the angels went away from them into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, 
Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. Did they all go? Did they leave any shepherds behind to protect the sheep? Did they simply lock the gate of, of the enclosure that they were using to keep their sheep together and they all took off? We have lots of questions we just don't know about this passage. But at least a good number of them decided it's time to go into Bethlehem and take a look. And they found him. And it was just exactly like the angel told them. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. You can imagine. These, these shepherds come barging into this stable. Stinky shepherds who've been following sheep around. You know what you get you on your feet when you follow sheep, right? And these shepherds come barging in to this quiet scene. And they say, you wouldn't believe it, what we just heard. And everyone wondered. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as had been told them. Now, it doesn't say that the shepherds were rejoicing. I, I think Luke, you know, could have put that in, but glorifying and praising God. What were they doing? They were rejoicing. I don't think he needs the word here. We know exactly what they were doing. These guys went back to the sheepfold, talking a mile a minute. Excited. Happy. The Savior that we've been waiting for is here. Now. After all this time, Dag Hammarskjöld said this about the first Christmas. For him who looks toward the future, the manger is situated on Golgotha, and the cross has already been raised in Bethlehem. God's program is in motion. When you have great joy, who do you want to share it with? You get good news. Where do you want to go? You want to tell your parents. You want to tell your wife, your spouse. But shepherds? Okay, I can understand Zechariah. Zechariah was a pious old priest. Yeah, makes sense. Mary, obviously, she has to bear the Christ child. She was a righteous young woman, from what we read. But shepherds? They won't even let them testify in court. They're not trustworthy. And God announced the birth of His Son. Good news. Great joy to the shepherds. They understood. They were excited. Salvation is not about positions or power, but about receiving the message of God, believing the message of God, and praising God. And that is what the shepherds did. We need to be very careful lest we develop a kind of spiritual arrogance and exclusiveness. Christ came to seek and save that which is lost. God sending His Son to be our Savior is a perpetual source of wonder and joy and praise. This is the meaning of Christmas. 
two further applications come to mind. The first is that we, each and every one of us, is significant in the way of the cross. Our self-esteem, our joy, must be based on the fact that we are significant to God. We can all hold the high position of glorifying God and serving His kingdom. And second, there is not a single person whom you will meet this week or work with this week or talk to this week who is not significant to God. Every single person whom we encounter this week is an appropriate receptor for God's good news. As we prepare to close, let's sing together. Hymn number 107, Go Tell It on the Mountain. this morning is taken from Romans chapter 16 verses 25 to 27 now to him who is able to strengthen you according to my gospel in the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery that was kept secret for long ages but has now been disclosed and through the prophetic writings has been made known to all nations according to the command of the eternal God to bring about the obedience of faith. To the only wise God be glory forevermore through Jesus Christ. Amen.